Frank, I know uh, you, you said before that you don't pay any attention to standings. Why is that? How is that relevant in anything? That's for fans. That's for 24-hour news cycles. That's for, like, bracketology. Really? Really? Heck, if it was up to bracketology in February, we've been in the NCAA tournament, I think, four times in my seven years here. But, you know, that's for other people to talk about. That's to create interest and, you know, get people excited. I get that. That's... I, that doesn't. I'm a fan too. So when I'm following a different sport, I kind of get engaged with that stuff, and it, you know, it keeps you interested. Uh, um, it, it's when, when you're in that room every day. You, if you're wrapped up about that, you're not going to have success. You, you, it's it's about getting better. It's about the next day. As soon as you say, "Oh, we're in fourth place," you lose three in a row. You're not going to be in fourth place anymore. Um, you know, it's uh, one day at a time, and uh, you know, I, there's a place for all that. It's just not for, it shouldn't be, for the people that are in that room every single day, banging their heads against the wall and against each other, uh, to try and get better. Coach, although I just heard you answer the question about not really caring about the standings, but does it add more intrigue? Do you think it will create an even better atmosphere for Tuesday night, knowing it's such a big game between you guys and Ole Miss? Because if you win, you get that little jockey position for that fourth place in the standings. I know the fans in the area are certainly fired up about that possibility. Yeah, I, once again, Joe, it's, uh, all, all that stuff is, is good for fans. I mean, don't, don't misunderstand me either. Uh, I'd much rather be in fourth place than be in 11th place fighting and clawing to try and get to fourth place. It, it don't, does that make sense what I'm saying? I mean, I'd, I'd much rather it be that way. Uh, but in reality, whether you're in 4th or 11th, you think Mississippi cares. They're going to come in here and try and beat us. Um, yeah, it's uh, Texas A&M is in the bottom third of the league. I don't know where they're staying. I really don't. I know who's above us. I really don't know who's – I know we're tied with Ole Miss. I know who the three teams above us are. I have no idea what the standings are below that. Um, but I think Texas A&M is – did they look like a team the other day that's not very good? I mean, you guys watch the games just like I do. I think they're pretty good, you know. And and uh, you know, it's uh, it's awesome for our fans. And I hope they show up. I hope, like I said after the game on the radio, uh, I, you know, back in November, December, you know, we I get it, man. We we didn't play well sometimes. We weren't a finished product. Fans have the right to be mad. I, that's their prerogative. I, I I ask for fans to give us the three most important things that we have us as people, our time, our money, and our passion, you know. And, and when you ask people for those three things, you can ask them to invest those three things and then be okay when things aren't good, you know. And we ask them for that, and, and they've been great. Uh, they were frustrated back. I get it. But if you actually follow our team, if you can't get excited about these kids, I don't know what gets you excited about your team then. Uh, what these kids have done, the, the way how resilient they've been, how they continue to get better, fight, not give in. Um, you know, I'm real proud of them, and, and, and I hope our fans are too, and I hope they show up because our kids need them. We're, we're getting to that point of the season where every game gets really hard, um, um, and uh, our, our kids need all the help they can get right now. Coach, you, miss, you mentioned uh, Mississippi. Can you talk about Devontae Shuler, local guy coming back? Did you recruit him? And I guess what have you seen from him, his growth from freshman to sophomore as he's coming back home uh, Tuesday? Yeah, I did recruit him. I recruited him real hard. Uh, I'm a big fan of Devontae. Uh, his sister, Donella, and I stay in touch to this day. Um, you know, I, I, I'd rather, uh, you know, um, him speak about his recruitment, I don't think it's my place to be speaking about guys that don't sign with us, but I'm a big fan of Devontae. I always have, you know, always have been, always will be. He's a great kid. Um, you know, um, I, I got to know his whole family. You know, they're good people. Uh, uh, Donella still comes to our games. You know, his oldest sister, she still comes to the games. And uh, so I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I'm really happy for him. He's playing real well right now. Uh, he's he's an unbelievable competitor, as is their team. Uh, the one thing that that you know Kermit's getting a lot of credit right now, rightfully so, 
because he's got these kids playing at a high level and, and he's got them winning. He deserves the credit. They also have three guards who all started last year. Power forward, who's a National Junior College Player of the Year two years ago. Center's been in the program for three years. And then Kermit's brought a couple guys in that, that are playing real well for them that are now, you know, on the backside of their first year in the program. So he's got some ex- guards win. If you got good guards, you got a chance to win. And they've got three high level guards. Terrence Davis is basically a four year starter. You know, Brian Tyree has started for three straight years. He, he uh, you know, Devontae's last year was in and out of the lineup. This year he's an established starter. Um, they're good. They're, they're, they're good. And, and Kermit's got them, uh, you know, they're, they're defending at a high, high rate right now. And, and uh, uh, it's, it's going to be a hard game. It's going to be a hard game. Frank, you all have come back several times from double digits in the yeah. second half. What, what kind of traits of this team have enabled you guys to be able to do that? I, John, I, that's, that's one of the things that makes me proud of these kids because if you actually look at those games, it's kind of a microcosm of our season. Like things didn't go our way, you know, for numerous things back in the first part of the year. Uh, we, we've lost games. We've had injuries. Lineups have changed. Jermaine situation. I mean, it's just been one thing after another. Um, and for whatever reason, they keep coming back. They don't go away. They don't, they don't ever sit down and say, man, we just can't get this done. And it's the same way in games. Um, um, you know, I'd, I'd rather us not be down 13, 14. It, that accelerates the aging process a lot. Um, you know, but – but it's a fun ride, you know, it's a fun ride. I, I, you know, the problem is if you go down 12, 13, 14 uh, uh, against the top three teams in this league, you're not coming back. It's just simple as that. Um, you know, if we get down 12, 13 tomorrow because they're so good defensively, I don't think I, – I, I don't want to make a prediction, but I don't think we can overcome that. We, we have to – we have to uh, – we haven't defended well. You know, uh, in the first half, the last three games, we we've, we've not been good. We we've defended better in the second half. That's why we were able to beat Arkansas. That's why we were able to at least put up a fight at Tennessee. Uh, that's why we were able to come back and win on Saturday. But it, we got to defend better in the first half. Right now, the first halves have not been good defensively, and you know we talked a lot about that yesterday. Uh, we we we've got to figure out a way to do a better job there. But we 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 can't afford to keep living that life we're living, we're, we're down and, and figure out a way to fight to get back. we got to play better. The, the comeback record more surprising to you because you've got so many newcomers, so many freshmen? Uh, yes and no. Uh, the yes is because you're going through it with them for the first time. The, the no, they've been playing all year. So they've played so much basketball now, and, and the games that we played in the preseason – uh, schedule uh, or non-conference schedule uh, were high-level games, and and you know it's you know I sat here back I don't remember when it was November twenty-third, twenty-fourth, and I remember sitting here saying I've been sitting there on Sundays with real good teams to see where we're going in March, and when you're when that Sunday comes this year, whatever team that is looks up and says Wofford in their bracket. They're not going to sleep real good, you know. We've played like real good teams, you know. Wofford, Stony Brook. I mean, uh, I know those aren't popular names in the world of basketball, but in the world of coaches, those are real good teams. Um, and then the obvious guys. And those kids have had to play in every one of those games, and they didn't give in when we lost those games, uh, and they don't give in in the middle of games right now either. So that's why it's a yes and no because I'm going through it for the first time with them. You spoke at the time when Andy exited Ole Miss about your relationship with him and and how much it it really impacted you, kind of where he was. And you spoke about it a little bit ago. How do you like how Kermit has taken what Andy built and and kind of furthered that? Yeah, Andy and Kermit are very good friends. Those two guys are very good friends. Uh, So Kermit had a pretty good feel for the program. 
uh, because of his friendship with Andy. So he understood what he was walking into. Uh, Kermit, uh, is, it, it's no surprise to anybody that they're doing this well. He's got to, let, let's, let's, you know, let, 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 let's not forget what happened before last year, okay? It's a returning group of guys that have been there for a long time. Andy had won 20 games, I believe, 10 consecutive years. So last year was the only year where the kind of wheels kind of came off kind of deal. Um, and that's why he stepped away when he did. Uh, but because of their friendship, uh, Kermit had a pretty good understanding of personnel, what's in place, uh, what needed to change, things of that nature, and uh, before he took the job. And, and, but with all that said, I don't want to take a single ounce of credit away from Kermit. We all understand in this league when he took that job that Ole Miss was going to be a problem because he's really, really good at what he does. Um, and uh, uh, so it's, it's kind of a, uh, uh, it's a, you know, he's, he's, even though he played at Mississippi State, he's a Mississippi guy. He's, you know, he's home. Uh, he's excited. Uh, he's worked his tail off for a, for a high-level job. Uh, and uh, a lot of people had chances to hire him before, and they chose not to. You know, Ole Miss chose to hire him, and um, you know it's uh, it's it's um, it's it's kind of best of both worlds. There was winning in place already at Ole Miss. There was experienced players in place at Ole Miss, and real good players in that. And they brought in a coach that had a feel because of his relationship with Andy, and he's really good at what he does. So, kind of a perfect storm, kind of all lined up there. Frank, what have you seen in a Mike Coates over the last four games? What would you like to see him do better um, entering this, I guess, stretch run? Um, you know, I don't know how. I, I've tried real hard this year to get him uh, to play with more confidence. Uh, um, you know, his his defense is solid. He's always in the right place. Um, you know, his ball screen defense is high above average. Uh, but offensively, he's just not playing very well right now. And, uh, um, and rebounding, he's just not, not going after the ball. Um, you know, that's he, – he's – I've had numerous talks with him, as has everyone on our team and our staff. Uh, uh, I have no idea why uh, he's kind of put his confidence in the back seat. I, I have no idea why. And we're trying as hard as we can – because uh, he's a real good guy. He's a good teammate. Uh, we're trying really hard to help him right now because he's been a very good player for us for two and a half years. And, uh, um, you know, and he, he's, he solidifies our defense. Uh, uh, if he would rebound better defensively, especially, um, you know, um, it would make us even that much better defensively. And, um, you know, uh, I, I, I don't have an answer for you. You know, I, that's kind of the situation that we're in. He, he somehow um, has to, uh, you know, reach deep inside and, and find confidence that, uh, that, that I've been doing this here for three years. I, I know I can do this and, and go do it. He needs some good things to happen to him. Uh, but, uh, but offensively, he's just, uh, he's, he's just not engaged right now. You know, it, it's not even just the scoring. It's, uh, you know, the passes that are there that he's got to make that he won't make. And I, 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 I don't have an answer for you. Frank, all eight conference wins for you guys at the five-minute mark, it's been a single-digit game. Mm -hmm. Can you, what's, the, what's been the theme for you guys to be able to overcome in those final minutes? I just think that uh, we got a group of guys that really understand what we're doing right now. And offensively, we're executing. We're not playing one-on-one -on -one ball. Uh, we're, we're, we're playing through our structure with the game on the line and, and getting good shots, you know. And, um, you know, I think guys are putting time in the gym. You know, like uh, I don't, we played, what, Saturday? You know, Friday. I th Trey Campbell's played pretty good lately, not because he's made shots. He's actually – defensively better than he's been. He's trying to run the stuff that I'm asking him to run. And uh, a practice on Friday, he didn't make a shot. Don't practice over, I told us to Trey. I know it's late in the year. 
I know we're kind of going a bunch of days in a row. I was real easy on you yesterday. You probably need to go in the gym tonight, see that ball go through the net a couple times. And he did. And guess what? In the game, ball went in the net for him. So um, you, got, you can't have defensive breakdowns with the game on the line. And offensively, you got to play through whatever structure you're trying to play through, and then guys have to score. There's a lot of times that we run good offense and the ball don't go in the basket. So people say, oh, they're a bad offensive team. No, we just miss shots. Um, we've been pretty good in the last five minutes of games in those, you know, respect to our defense and, and our offense. And then we've, the ball's going in the basket. How much does that play into the offense, learning how to play around Chris now? Is that, is that, is that comparable to what you, what's happening in those five minutes? Hands down. Chris is playing. I, I'm, I'm a little disappointed that no one's giving him any credit right now. I, you know, I, I get it. P.J. Washington's real good. I understand. I that We played him, you know, 10 days ago, whatever it was. Uh, I'm willing to put the way Chris has played an SEC play up against anyone in this league right now. Uh, I mean, he's playing at a high, high, high level. He's playing better than he played last year, you know. And, um, you know, but all our guards are first-year guards, except Sonny, obviously. You know, they, they're understanding – College basketball, they're understanding our structure. And then the most important part, which is the part that, that no one ever wants to talk about, I understand them better now. You know, I, I comprehend what they're good at and what they feel more comfortable at. So I can put them in those areas so they can, as an athlete, you want to play. Everyone says, well, they don't play free. I've told you this before. Free is not let them go. Free is making sure guys understand what they're supposed to do so they can play through their strength. When they play through their strength, they play fast and aggressive. That way their decision-making is fast and aggressive. And I think I understand those guys a lot better now than I did back in November and December. And uh, so they're, they're able to, to, to do things in a more aggressive manner. Frank, you kind of just answered this, but specifically with the three ball, has that been by design? I mean, I know you said at the beginning of the season that this is a great shooting team, that you know that they're not getting as, um, as much credit maybe as they deserve for being a good shooting team. But in the last two games, has that been kind of by design or not? I, I think if you pay attention to our last month, we've been pretty consistent shooting the three. I, um, you know, last – what, what's happened the last two games is kind of the, the polar opposite of what happened early in the year. You know, it's, it's early in the year, we didn't make a lot of threes. Guys just didn't make them. Now we've kind of made a big number of them. We're not as bad or not as good. Uh, I mean, we're not a 60% three-point shooting team. That's not who we are. Uh, but we've learned to take good shots. We've learned to play inside out. Um, there's very few Steph Currys that shoot crazy shots and make threes. But if you actually pay attention, most of his threes come from Draymond Green or Klay Thompson or Kevin Durant attracting a double team and the ball coming from inside back out. That's how all majority of the shooters that are good get a lot of threes that way. Then you got your special shooters. Those are the ones that can shoot it on the move that you screen and they just come flying off, J.J. Reddick's of the world. Steph, J.J. Reddick, Clay, those guys, when those guys get a three where the ball goes in, out, they don't miss. They never miss. That's what good shooters do. Those are the shots that every coach in the world wants. What separates those guys is those guys can also make threes on the move. Uh, but everyone that can shoot, that ball goes in and comes back out, they're going to shoot it at a high clip, and we've learned to do that better. Um, that's where Mike's so important to us because Mike can create shots for guys with his ability to play in that 10 to 12 foot mark in the paint. Um, and, uh, and that's why it's so important that we engage him because, you know, those guys around, they can make shots. Chris can shoot it. Uh, Trey can shoot it. Sonny can shoot it. Uh, AJ can shoot it. Those guys, and they've, they've worked. Uh, Sonny didn't know how to work at it before. So he's a 20% three-point shooter. He didn't work at it. Well, he put in work in the offseason. He's learned how to keep working on it during the year. So the ball's going in for him. Same thing with Trey. You know, I said this early in the season about Trey. He's overcoming not just a transfer, but a major knee injury. He's feeling better. You know, it's uh, – um, but I don't know. But I, don't get me wrong. We keep shooting 16 for 23. I'm all in.
Heck, we'll shoot 40 of them then. <laughs> Frank, the, uh, talk about Chris playing at a high level. I think the last three games, too, it's three fouls or fewer, um, which is the best stretch of his season. Mm -hmm. Two of those games obviously come with, with Evan no longer being in the mix, so you're down a man and he needs to be out there on the floor. He had 39 mi minutes against Tennessee. Is that a chance? He talked about he's gotten better in defending ball screens and not hand checking, you know, 40 feet from the bat, stuff like that. Have you sensed a change in him, or is it just kind of the way the game's been officiated? Is there something to the fact that he's been able to stay on the floor more le recently? He hasn't committed those bad fouls he could. Like last game, his first foul, it's a bad foul. Guy's driving the ball to the baseline, he's coming on help side defense. You can't go over there and put your hand on the guy and push him. That's a bad foul, you know? And. Um, and that's what he did. He's avoided those. Uh, when we shoot, and he's such an aggressive offensive rebounder, you can't just go in there and grab guys and jump on people's backs. Uh, he stayed away from those fouls. Um, um, uh, you know, some there, there's there's you got role players. That means guys that that you know play 10, 12 minutes, whatever, and their role is to go grab every rebound. If they foul, they foul. Don't worry about it. Go after the ball. And you got guys that need to stay on the court. Chris has worked really hard at trying to differentiate the guy he was his first year and a half here, where his role was just go rebound and do nothing else, uh, to now a guy that has to stay on the floor for us. There's sometimes that as much as I want them to go offensive rebound, they box you out. The other team's got good players. Sometimes they win the play. You can't, when they win the play, you can't hang your head, but you can't say, ah, oh, I'm not going to accept it and jump on a guy's back. You just can't do that. And he's, he's avoided those plays. Uh, but if you look at his numbers in SEC play, minus the – and I know it's all part of it. You can't do that. But if you take away the two games that he's been in real bad foul trouble where his minutes have been real bad, his num I'll put his numbers up against anybody. Uh, you know, he, he's rebounding better than he's ever rebounded in his time here. His, his – I don't know how many blocks he had the other day against Texas A&M. But yeah, but his ball screen defense and his protection of the rim in the second half was as good as I've ever coached. Um, it's uh, uh, he, he's he's doing things at a high high clip right now. Frank, on the subject of three point defense, is there anything from a coaching standpoint you see that makes a team good at defending the three point line, or is it just a byproduct of your defense overall? I ask that because I look at. Ole Miss, I know you feel good about their defense. Their three-point field goal percentage defense isn't good. South Carolina's has been closer to the bottom than the top of the league this year. Is there anything that you think that you can draw a line to that, or is that just sometimes a matter of shots going in or not? I think they play a lot of zone. And when you play zone, people shoot more threes against you. So I think for them, that's just a guess on my part. I, um, um, on-ball defense, to me, is the best remedy for three-point field goal percentage defense. If you're not good defending the ball, then the ball's going to get behind you. Everyone on your team knows it's going to get behind you. So then what happens is everyone behind the defender of the ball is prepared to collapse. So when you collapse, they pitch. So now the ball goes inside out. Ball goes inside out, I just said it, Guys make most of those. And if they don't shoot it, then that guy's in a closeout. The worst thing to be in as a defender in a game of basketball is in a closeout. It is the hardest thing to do defensively. And, and now you're in a closeout, you got to get to him. If you get to him, then he don't shoot it, but chances are that guy's going to drive you. So if that guy drives you, now you got your rotations are really, really tested. Um, but I, I – to me, it's always on-ball defense. You know, we had Dwayne Notice. He was so good on the ball. Sindarius and PJ on the wings can be very aggressive defending screens and, and staying out on shooters because we were confident that Dwayne was going to be on that ball. Um, uh, you know, that's because of all our first-year guys. I, I can't speak for Ole Miss, but I can speak for us. That's been a challenge for us keeping the ball in front of us. It's been, you know, and, and, and Felipe, who's gotten better at it, but he, his ball screen defense isn't what it needs to be yet. Alonzo's not very good at it. Um, so, you know, it just it puts tremendous pressure on your help defense. And uh, the idea is to help. 
But the idea is also to not have to help. You, I don't know if that makes sense. You know, you, you got to train your defense to be prepared to help, but you don't want to help. You'd rather just man up and guard yours. And, and, and that, that alleviates three-point field goal percentage defense a lot. Frank, you mentioned after, I guess, Texas A&M that Chris and Trey and Hassani's clocks were kind of ticking a little bit with six games left, and the freshman kind of needed to step up. Mm -hmm. and is, have you sensed that, I guess, in the, I guess, the day following? And how do you get the freshmen to play with a little bit more sense of urgency, that, knowing that these guys' clocks are winding down a little bit? Yeah, we talk. I mean, yeah, it's my job. I asked, I asked Felipe, uh, with the, uh, you know, I, AJ too. I included him in the conversation, but it was more directed at Alonzo and Keyshawn. And you know, and I, I told those guys, I said, I don't know how long you guys will be here for. You know, two, three, four years. I got no idea. But the day you're a senior, how are you going to feel if a freshman don't lay it on the line for you when you got six games to go? Is that what you is that what you would want from your teammate? You know, are you going to do that to your teammate? Don't do it to our seniors, man. We're all seniors at what day? What at one once upon a time? If we're lucky, we're all seniors. And when you're a senior and you only got X number of opportunities left, and that means that you've spent four years sacrificing for that uniform, uh, as a, there's nothing. I don't. You see, guys can make me mad every day. It's part of life, man. I'm dealing with 18 to 22 year olds. I'm, I was no different when I was that age. But there's nothing worse than a bad teammate. I don't forgive bad teammates. If mistakes with me, I'm, I'm always on let's move forward, let's move forward, let's grow, let's grow. I'm going to hold you accountable, let's grow. I'm good with all that. But if you're a bad teammate, I got no forgiveness in my heart for you. And, and getting guys to understand that in today's day and age is getting harder because our society at that, at, at that age has gotten so individualistic. How popular am I? Uh, you know, how many followers do I have? How many retweets can I get? You know, and, uh, um, and, and that, that, that's a challenge right now. Uh, but that, we talked about that. That's, that's part of building a team is that, that your freshmen care about your seniors and, and your seniors are willing to – and I told the seniors, I said, if I got to fight the fight for you, we're not winning down the stretch. You guys got to help me get these guys engaged to do things the right way. That's part of a senior responsibility. Sendarius wouldn't let it happen. I can tell you, Michael Carrera, Sendarius, Mendogas, Dwayne, all those guys, we'd be in practice, and, and especially late in the year. If they knew there was a guy on the team that was going to mess a drill up, yo, man, no, no, get out. You can't be on my team. Get out. Yo, you, over there, come on. That's what they would do. That's leadership. That's leadership. That's Now I don't have to do it. You know, they do it themselves. And that creates that peer pressure that you're always fighting. Your coaches all the time say successful teams are run by the players. That's what they're talking about. You know, that's, that's what you call leadership there. And our seniors have to be better at that. A little off topic, but – in AJ's recruitment, how did you, when did you learn of his father's obviously connection to this state and him, his whole background? He kind of grew up a Gamecock fan, stuff like that. How did that play a role in it? I mean, everybody talks about in state recruiting. This was kind of a, a part of that in a different way. A kid coming from Canada with a family connection. Yeah, I mean, I, I told you how it all started. You know, Chuck had been recruiting Toronto for a while. I've recruited Toronto. Um, uh, Chuck. When I hired Chuck, he gave me a couple names in Toronto that I didn't know about. Uh, uh, one of them's a young man that's starting center at UTEP right now, and the other one was AJ. And I went up there, and and we saw saw them play at an event. I saw AJ, but we thought he was young. We thought he still had a year of high school left, uh, that he'd be a high school senior right now. So we started recruiting, but not as engaged as we needed to. Uh, they were coming they, – his, his high school team was driving from Toronto, I think, to Orlando for a tournament. And they stopped through here on the way to Orlando. And, you know, Chuck spent a couple hours with them just showing them around and stuff. And uh, shortly after that, Chuck said, uh, I talked to the dad. You know, he's from South Carolina. I was like, wow, what a coincidence. And, and then the conversations got deeper and deeper. And then um, – as, as we got closer to the end of spring, early summer, we realized, like, I think he wants to come out now. And, and that's when the conversations then got really aggressive because uh, there was already relationships in place. But then that's when it got really aggressive. And, um, 
Yeah, and then when they came on the official visit, you know, the dad ecstatic. You know, it's uh, uh, that he was back in South Carolina, and um, you know, one it's funny is the guy on my staff, his mom. Uh, I, I don't want to misspeak here. Either still is or was a school teacher at the high school where AJ's dad went to school. So they started talking about that whole community and the whole thing. And um, uh, so, long story short, AJ's dad loved the Gamecocks as a kid, and uh, um, you know. And then we we built relationships as human beings. And uh, he wasn't going to come to South Carolina because he was born and raised in South Carolina. I'm talking about the dad, uh, or the kid wasn't going to come because the dad was. But, uh, but once there was a relationship of trust, which is what I worked to build in recruiting, I'm not into public opinions, I'm into real stuff. Um, and once that was in place, and you add the caveat that, you know, that there's still family here, um, you know, it's uh, um, it, it made it for a powerful moment. And uh, there were other schools that were hot and heavy after him. And, uh, and you know, we sat around there. We were worried. And then when we got that call, you know, we, we were real happy. We always thought A.J. had a chance to be really, really good. We thought it would be a year from now. But he's been, he's been great. He's been uh, fun to coach. And, and just he, he's funny because when he first got here, I'll give you a little A.J. deal. He first got here, he always wore his bubble jacket. You know, those big, thick bubble jackets. He goes, I love bubble jackets. Oh, I love them. I love them. I love them. I said, I got one. I just never use it because there's no need to use a bubble jacket in South Carolina. Well, I'm going to use mine every day. So it'd be 60 degrees. Back in the fall, he's walking around with a bubble jacket. He, uh, he went home for Christmas, and uh, sometime, I don't know, late January or something, we're sitting around talking. He's like, I don't think I like that cold air anymore. <laughs> so uh, I haven't seen him with that bubble jacket very often anymore. But uh, uh, great kid, great family. Uh, obviously, uh, we need him to play real well coming down the stretch here.